Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Content Officer Brad Behrens. everybody here. Come on in. People are trickling in. Now, you know, this is our, uh, this is our 15th year uh, of ad tech. This is our 10th ad tech here in San Francisco. And for those of you who are walking, you can ignore this. Everybody else, if this is your first ad tech, please stand up. Stand up if this is your first ad tech. Come on, you can do it. All right, everybody else, look at them. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Look at them. These are the people to be nice to, okay? Now, everybody else, if, you, if, this is, if you've been to more than five ad techs, stand up, please. Stand up. Well, all right, these are our old friends. So, welcome to the big show. Thank you so much for coming. We are, uh, can we bring up the slides? We're living in an incredible time. An incredible time. We are, and I think this is, I was thinking, how do we express what's going on right now? And I think it's this, surfing a wave of change. Things change so quickly for us here in this industry. And you're all here, and I want to thank you for coming because you are busy people. It's hard to make time to prairie dog up from your screens and your phones and to actually get out and, and learn something. But the, what you're going to do over the next few days here is you're going to be rubbing shoulders with people who you're going to have uh, conversations, you're going to see presentations, and you're going to network, and you're going to get the best that this incredible industry has to offer in two days. So let's talk about what's happening. That's what's happening out there is everything analog is going digital. This is from a remarkable Forrester report that came out just about a week ago. And if you look, we have TVs are today versus in 2016, we have a decline for non-connected TVs, but we have a rise for connected TVs. The same is true for the mail, right? We have a decline in mail. And you all know from the state of your inboxes every day that we have an incredible increase in email. It's true for landlines going down and mobile, phone, mobile lines going up. Everything that can be digitized will be digitized. And that's very good for this industry. This is a chart from our friends at eMarketer. Look at that, look at that incredible change. They're predicting virtually a twice the spend in the internet, in digital advertising between now and 2015. That is coming out of newspapers and magazines. TV will continue to grow if you look at 53.8 versus 68 but it's not going to grow uh, as fast as digital is growing, which is going to double. And look at this share. Look at that top line, which is TV, again, still growing from 36.5% to 39.2%. But whoa, here's the internet coming from 15.4 to 25.6. You are dealing with a revolutionary industry. That's why you're here. And it's an exciting time to be here. Everything that is becoming digital, and everything that's digital is becoming social. So my friend Jack Myers, he has a report that came out a few weeks ago. Look at this growth. 2010, 50% growth in the amount of energy and money we're spending on social media, on digital word of mouth, on conversational marketing. 60% growth, he's predicting, for this year. 85% growth for next year, which is still, when it comes to the overall marketing power, leading only to a 0.06% share. So what that shows is the vast opportunity as everything gets connected and as you wind up in different conversations with your customers and your partners, you're going to see ever more complexity but also ever more opportunity. This is one example. This came out over the weekend. What we see is that Motorola, Motorola Mobility is launching an app for their own appliances and then for other tablets, which is channeling the simultaneous media consumption. We've got three different ver words for the same thing. There's simultaneous media consumption, there's continuous partial attention, and then there's what we really think of it more normally as simply multitasking. All of those are three slices at the same pie. And they're all important because it shows how attention, which is our most precious commodity, is being sliced and diced. What's interesting about what Motorola and other companies like it, what's interesting about this is that it shows that people are working to channel that multitasking so that it reinforces the other media consumption. So you're sitting on the couch watching the big screen. You've got the little screen in your lap. We've been doing that for years, but now what we're trying to do is have the little screen reinforce what's happening on the big screen. Now, everything's changing, including 
us and our friends at Nielsen. We're very proud and pleased in a long-time partnership with them. They have a report that they've just released spe special for this event, which is called The New Digital American Family, Understanding Family Dynamics, Media, and Purchasing Behavior Trends. Here's just one top-line tidbit from that, which is that by 2020, the vast majority of households in this country will be multicultural. The, of households, I'm sorry, with children 18 and under. So by 2020, if you have a house and you've got teenagers or youngsters who are younger than teenagers, you're probably living in a multicultural family. Now, what does that do to your ad creative? What does that do to how you approach things? This is just one of many fascinating things that are, that are surfaced in this report. So you can download it at nielsenwire.com. You can visit the Nielsen booth. And uh, at 10.30, they're going to be presenting the results of this in the conference. Now, it's hard to put a show of this scope on. And this is a, uh, an Amish barn raising. And I want to talk with you about some of the people who are helping us to raise this particular barn. This is our uh, ad tech advisory board, which we need this many people because it's uh, so vast, the endeavor that we're doing here. So it's hard to read this, but you can uh, see it in the program guide or in the mobile app. We have our ad tech marketing masters. These are people who are curating multi-hour tracks of content for you, people who we've leaned on, they're thought leaders and experts. We have sessions for you on media, on mobile, on search, on email, on social, on affiliate, and uh, on video, and on tablets. So I'm very grateful to, to these folks who are uh, among our many speakers but who've taken an extra burden in curating multiple hours of content. Because we have six concurrent tracks of content, we also figured we needed to have some guides. And so these are our five ad tech ambassadors. These are your proxies. If you're a brand marketer and you're trying to figure out what you ought to go to, well, then check out what Scott Noble's blog on our website, because he's saying what he's going to. Similarly, Deidre Bodkin is our mobile ambassador. These are the folks who are helping you to figure out what to go to, because my gosh, there's a whole lot to see. We have uh, social media. You can uh, track, follow us on Twitter and join our Facebook and LinkedIn. Also, we have a really swanky new mobile app, which is like, unlike anything we've done before, which is fantastic. It's telling you how to get to places. It's telling you what to see. And it's all in your pocket. We couldn't do it without our sponsors. So let's give a big round of applause to everybody who's supporting this event so that you can all be here. And I want to do a special shout out to our friends at Casali, who are our keynote uh, sponsors here. You can see their logo in the room. Now, an invisible sponsor, but uh, here in the room, but one that's very important. It's a path-breaking new thing. Our friends at YouTube are live streaming today's keynote. They live streamed Ad Tech Inspire yesterday, and they'll be doing most of the main stage stuff. So if you're on Twitter right now, and people you know may want to be seeing what's about to be happening on stage, please give them this link and let everyone know. This is very, very exciting. This is a chart. It changes every time because new and exciting things happen every time. But look at this transformative industry. Just look. And as far back as 1995 when Amazon reinvented how to buy books, my daughter was born in 2001, which is the birth year of the iPod. She turned 10 a couple weeks ago. What was the one gift she wanted? An iPod Touch. My son was born in 2005, the same year that our uh, partner YouTube was born. We had Amazon once again reinventing things with the Kindle in 2007 alongside the iPhone and Living Social. Last year, we had the iPad and Connect launch, both transformative technologies. Who's next? What's going to be the next big thing that we'll look back on and go, wow, golly, that was huge? Well, we have something new here at AdTech, which is our startup spotlight. And it's four hours where new companies which have uh, case studies and are making pitches to show brands and agencies what they can do and why it's important. And we have our advisory board here of the people who helped us to choose these companies. It's a new kind of content for us. We're very excited about it. After our session this morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, we have our exhibit hall opening. It's the biggest show in the industry. You've got to get down there and see it. It's unbelievable. And then we also, of course, have a conference, which you know about. And that starts, and this is, we have so much going on that that's how small the font on this slide is. We have five, or six, my God, six concurrent sessions. Uh, we have uh, social gaming, we have search, we have mobile, we have neuromarketing, and we have uh, the digital demographics. And that's just the first hour. 
starting at 1030. You're going to have some hard choices to make. There's a lot of exciting stuff. Check out those ambassadors because they're going to really help you to understand what's going on. Back here on the main stage at 1.15 p.m., Guy Kawasaki is giving an afternoon keynote. He's a writer of many books. He's also most recently written Enchantment, which is a truly delightful and, uh, and strangely uplifting book, uh, which I read cover to cover and enjoyed thoroughly. Tomorrow, we have Guy being joined by the legendary uh, presentation expert, Nancy Duarte, and they're doing a workshop on presentations. So if you have a presentation that you're either proud of, uh, scared of, have something you need to do, or just something you'd like some help on, we have this link. Please go and sign up now, and you may be able to have your presentation workshopped by two of the best in the business. Tonight, we'll close the main stage content with my friend Jeffrey Cole. He's the director of the USC Annenberg Center for the Digital Future. They have the best longitudinal data on how the internet is changing every fabric of our existence. And that's at 515 right here in this room. And what do you do after a long day of, uh, of wandering around, of talking, of, of learning, of chatting, of seeing new things, of getting things out of the, out of the expo, the conference? You have a party. We're going to have a big networking bash right here in the lobby outside uh, on the third floor at 6 o'clock. So that's the kind of day that you have in store for you. I think you've made the right choice in coming here. I'm grateful that you've come here. In a few minutes, I'm going to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Antonio Lucio, who is the CMO of Visa. But first, I want to talk about uh, our Industry Achievement Awards. One of my pr great privileges is to chair the committee that elects the people. Each year we have a class of three, and the people who join this group of people who have moved the industry forward, who have worked beyond their jobs, who have helped people and helped companies to achieve their fullest potential in this industry. And um, I chair it, but I don't vote. It, the people who vote to choose those people are the previous recipients. So I'd like to have you welcome to the stage one of our previous recipients, one from the first class, David Smith of Media Smith, local to, to San Francisco. And he is going to present the award and give some context behind today's first recipient, Jeff Ramsey of eMarketer. Guys, come on out. Good morning. Um, I'm here to uh, bestow this uh, Industry Achievement Award on Jeff Ramsey. Uh, now, a lot of you have probably seen. How many people here have seen uh, Jeff speak before? A lot of people. That's good. 38.6%. Uh, all right. Uh, you probably, who have seen him speak before, don't know that he had a previous career as a magician. Now, interestingly, that, that could be uh, said to be a prerequisite for being either in advertising or statistics, I think. Um, Susan Bratton, uh, former recipient of this award, uh, said that his indefatigable education of the masses and the fresh faces of our industry. Uh, so those of you who have not heard him speak, uh, get to a conference uh, that Jeff is, uh, is speaking at because uh, it's definitely worthwhile. He definitely represents the gold standard in information uh, for the direction and growth of the digital landscape. Uh, Brad Behrens uh, called him a scintillating PowerPoint Jedi. And Brad claims that he didn't invent that term, but he certainly uh, fostered it. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are online, and I, 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 what percentage of people here are online right now, Jeff? Of these people? Yes. They're all online right now. Okay, all right, all right. 100 percent. Jeff doesn't generally say 100 uh, percent. Go to his Facebook page. I love Jeff Ramsey's PowerPoints. I've already run out of time. Uh, 17 years building brands, co-marketer of, co-founder of eMarketer, mission of helping marketers, ad agencies, and everyone else in the online marketing ecosystem. Now, how many people have in their mission statement to help all of us, all right? It's in his mission statement, all right? Um, he's really grown uh, eMarketer to over 100 professionals. He's spoken at hundreds of conferences. He's quoted everywhere. Uh, and uh, no one separates the hype from the reality like Jeff. Uh, we depend on his information uh, uh, on, a, on a literally a daily basis. I, I quoted him twice in my tweets this morning. Um, he's a runner. He's a supremely happy married for 19-year person with four children. 
and I can vouch for the fact that he's a great dinner companion. Jeff Ramsey. Thank you, Dave. I don't normally get nervous, but I'm very nervous. Uh, I only have about three minutes, so, uh, and, and I have a confession to make that uh, I feel really, really nervous, particularly because I'm not allowed to do any PowerPoint. So there's no slides here. I'm just working off of some notes. I feel almost naked. Um, I was also told that this is not supposed to be a thank you. Uh, Brad gave very specific instructions that I was supposed to talk about what makes me happy about the industry. But as my wife always reminds me, you are most happy when you are thankful. So the two are kind of interchangeable for me. Um, I was going to, in this, run through all of the numbers and trends and talk about wasn't it exciting when the internet passed outdoor? Does anybody remember that back in something like 1997 or something? And then when it passed consumer magazines and then it was uh, uh, radio and then last year uh, internet ad spending passed newspapers. But then I decided, no, you know, it's really not about the numbers and trends. What makes me happy in this industry is the people. And I just wanted to say a couple of words or examples of people that uh, have been instrumental in, in whatever success I've enjoyed at eMarketer. And one of them is in this audience is uh, one of my partners, Sam Alstead, who back in 1996 insisted, as we were a small ad, ad agency at the time, that we needed to get this internet thing. We need to figure it out and, and create a website that was going to be this kind of beacon of of understanding and intelligence about what was going on with the internet. And I said, the internet? I had seen these early CompuServe, uh, sorry, you know, prodigy examples, and I just was, I was, I went in kicking and screaming, saying I'm not going for this internet thing. So I researched it, and of course, the, the rest is history. I became very interested in the internet, and I'm still ensconced in it. I'd also like to thank my partner, Terry, who makes me very, very happy because he allows me to go out and do speeches and presentations all over the world while he actually runs the show back at eMarketer. So thank you, Terry. What makes this business so exciting and makes me so happy are people that are, like the people that are in this room, like Susan Bratton, who at one point was the person kind of like the Brad Barons of ad tech, and she was inviting me to speak at another ad tech and she scheduled a conference call with me, and then I got on the phone, and I thought we were just going to talk about what, what kind of trends she wanted me to talk about. And she says, no, I want to talk about your speaking style. This isn't something I was accustomed to hearing. I had usually gotten fairly good reviews and good feedback on my speaking, but Susan was basically saying, Jeff, you're capable of reaching higher. And then she proceeded, not to dress me down, I, that was a little too strong, but she proceeded to tell me that I needed to focus less on the numbers and trends and be a little bit more real with who I was and just let my voice of authority come out. And, and really, she, she helped transform me. That kind of, you know, holding someone accountable, holding a mirror up to somebody is, a, is something we need to see more of. It's just an amazing thing when somebody can do that, and certainly my wife is very capable of that. Um, but more on that later. Uh, people like Dave Smith, who I can sit for three and a half hours at a dinner and never get bored talking about you know, all of the stuff we used to do in ad agencies and the struggles that we had. And friends like Dave Morgan, who I just had another lunch with, and gave me an amazing uh, piece of advice, which I might share with you later. But anyway, all this to say, uh, I am very, very happy to be in this industry since 1996. Um, and I also am very happy, uh, happily married, as I said before. My wife has kept me honest, and uh, just like Susan, has held up that mirror to me to, to keep me on the, on the straight and narrow, and also taught me the three Bs, which is to believe in yourself, uh, always be seeking betterment, and the most important thing, which I encourage all of you to do, is to seek balance. You know, work and, and play are ver both very important. And finally, I just want to say I'm supposed to end with what I'm excited about, and that's very, very simple. I'm excited about you, every person in this room who has helped make this industry as successful as it is. Thank you very much. I appreciate the award. Congratulations. All right. Thanks, Brad. Thanks a lot. Congratulations, Jeff. Now, we have uh, Antonio Lucio. He is the global CMO of Visa. 
big California company, San Francisco company. He has 25 years of experience as a marketer. He's worked for little companies like Kraft, Procter & Gamble, and PepsiCo. And I asked him to open the show today because he has the big perspective. Digital is a huge and, and growing and significant part of the overall marketing endeavor. Antonio is responsible for the entire marketing endeavor. And so when we were trading emails and chatting, and the, the title that he presented, which has absolutely thrilled me, is what you're about to hear, which is Audience First, Driving Engagement Through Digital. We're very lucky to have him with us. Please give a warm ad tech welcome to Antonio Lucio. Good luck. Good morning. My God, San Francisco, good morning. Excellent. I want to share two things about myself before I start my presentation. First, I am the proud father of five daughters, ranging in ages from 9 to 29, which in terms of this conference means that I know more about social media than I ever cared to know. The second part is that I've been a marketer for over 25 years. I honestly feel that I have been blessed by the opportunity to build businesses, brands, and marketing structures all around the world. So I've seen many things, many trends, many global trends. I can honestly say that in my entire career, I have never seen such a transformational change as the one that we are living today. And that never, never has there been a more exciting time to be a marketer than today. So where you sit, you better acknowledge that you guys are blessed, that you have an incredible opportunity to change the world, and importantly, to change the way that marketing and business is conducted. Let me tell you about our transformation. I am a marketing guy, so numbers go first. In a two and a half year period, we've gone from 10% of our marketing budget in digital to 36%, and in many instances, almost 40%. In order to do that, we had to move digital from the periphery of the marketing equation to the center to make it a pillar of all engagement and communication. Importantly, and let me be very emphatic about this as the chief marketing officer of my company, through this move, we were able to deliver all our financial and brand equity targets. All, meaning total transactions, total revenue, and total brand equity. So my first message to you, all of those that are only involved in the digital space, if you come to me to share with you results of your digital little world, that doesn't matter to me. If you're able to use that digital capability to build the totality of the brand and to actually deliver the financial targets, now we're talking. So when agencies come to me with best case, my first question is, did that move the needle on the total brand? Did that actually deliver on the revenue side of the equation? What I'm about to show you actually proved that it can, but that you have to do some major transformational changes to ensure that that happens. We've done six things. First, a bit controversial, but we actually had to destroy the digital marketing team and embed those resources inside the core brands. Why? At the time in which we started two and a half years ago, that digital team was a lab where people had a budget. They were doing all sorts of cool things, winning, by the way, all sorts of digital prestigious awards but that was not moving the needle on the total brand basis. It became like a separate island. It was not integrated into the totality of the communication strategy. Second thing that I had to do starting over was to build a directional business case for the digital investment. I said directional because at the time, I didn't have enough facts to actually prove what the right number was going to be. Today, I do. So when I say 30, when I say 40, I can actually prove that that is the optimal mix that we need within our business. At the moment we started, it was a directional call. Why? 
From a business standpoint, three segments drive our business. Affluent, e-commerce, and cross-border. All digitally-led transactions. Second, we were actually finding out through our data that the concept of purchase had moved from an action into a comprehensive experience that transcended the transaction. So from an action to a comprehensive social experience that transcended the transaction. So we set a target. The target is 30. Why? Because it feels good. And we started moving the entire organization towards that particular end. In the process, we had to change our way of evaluating all this media. I'll share that with you. We had to steal best practice from best-in-class partners, whether that was McKinsey or our agency ORM&D or our agency AKQA. We started requiring a lot more from our digital partners. We started co-develop work with some of the digital providers, like Google, like Facebook, like Twitter. And importantly, we began to develop new offerings to actually maximize the level of engagement. But let's start at the very beginning. Let me give you a two-minute background on who we are. First and foremost, we are a payment network. We do not issue credit. Our credit is issued by our banks. We process the transactions, whether that transaction is debit, is credit, is money transfer, or e-commerce. And we do it through a network of about 16,000 financial institutions around the world, 30 million merchants, and we process about $5.2 trillion per year. We exist as leaders of the category to gain share from cash. So we compete on a share basis versus our competitors on a B2B basis for the share of our issuers or banks or for a share of acceptance with our merchants. But when it comes to the consumer, it is our role to actually educate them and motivate them to use electronic payments or Visa instead of cash. Because that, is our, because that is our objective, our positioning or lighthouse is being built to deliver that target. At the top of our pyramid, the vision of our founder, D. Hawk, 50 years ago he had the vision of the combination of big old main, main, mainframe computers with money and the possibility of creating a new universal currency for life. Those are not agency words, that's not poetry, those were his words. On the rational side of our brands is the pillars that build our business all the time. From the moment that it was built, acceptance, security, convenience, and value. On the emotional side, empowerment, the ability to live life the way you want to at the moment that you want to. At the center versus cash or versus our competitors on the different areas of the world, we will consistently deliver against the promise of better money for better living. Our campaign is built on two premises driving transactions against cash based on our lighthouse of better money for better living. Our objective from a communication strategy is to drive actions into transactions by providing the comprehensive rational and emotional benefits that our brand provides. That's what we do. Let me share with you now the changing environment in which we are operating today. The word, the prevailing word is convergence. One of our agency partners modified it and called it COM, C-O-M, vergence. The convergence of everything that has to do with commerce. During the Christmas season, 83% of all shoppers were looking at customers' review in the net. Interestingly enough, 70, 70% of those purchases were done on the real world or offline. Convergence. Second, Facebook has changed the way in which we communicate. I've learned the transcendental through the ir irrelevant. I've known how people get married or get divorced, hook up, break up. Actually, 
One of my daughters told me yesterday that she had become Facebook official with her boyfriend. I had to ask what Facebook official was, and she said, well, it's the time when you change your status from single to in a relationship. <laughs> but importantly, the type of conversation that we're interested on in Facebook is recommendations. I'll give you a very simple example. I was born in Spain, and I grew up in Puerto Rico. Through Facebook, I've been able to connect with all the people that I've dealt with around the globe. One lady yesterday, lunchtime, tweets connected to her Facebook account, in Puerto Rico, I am hungry. Where should I have lunch, and what should I have? Immediately, people from all over the world were giving her recommendations as to restaurants in Puerto Rico. Just think about that for a minute. People from all over the world were giving her recommendations as to a restaurant and what she should eat at that moment. So the power of the, 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 the social connection within the context of recommendations and purchase is huge. You will hear from Zynga later on and the concept of gaming. What's interesting about this is that we can talk about digital goods all you want, but digital goods are purchased with real money. And the level of engagements that people are having in gaming today is real engagement. This is such an important segment of the commerce of tomorrow that Visa bought PlaySpan, a monetization platform that allows transactions in the digital currency world. Then there's this whole e-commerce section that it grows by the minute. It grows the highest growing segment of our business, over 20% last year. It is so important that at the beginning of the year, we purchase CyberSource, a gateway of e-commerce retailers into our network. It also means that retailers like Amazon, last week published, had become a more trusted brand than any of the consumer goods companies in the United States when it comes to recommendations and behavior. So this world of convergence or convergence is affecting the way in which we think about business going forward. Three tents that we watch. And they are talked about individual trends, but as you guys know in your world, there's nothing individual or siloed. Everything combines. Social commerce through living social or Groupons. Big, huge, growing. The opportunity that they have is to make it more relevant, relevant per each offering. The challenge is that it could become noise in the long term local, and importantly, social search. My, I mentioned the, 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 the example of my friend in Puerto Rico about restaurant. Two weeks ago, one of my friends from the Bay Area actually sent a request. Does anybody know a NFC, near field communication, which is what you use for, to make your mobiles actually active in the point of sale, supplier in the Bay Area. I mean, that's the quintessential Google search happening through social. All these trends just create a huge amount of opportunity. All these trends have made us change our business model, become more active in the acquisition space, and change the way that we do marketing. So everything has changed, and we've had to change our business model. But for all of those of you who are involved in the digital space, a lot has been written about the fact that consumers are in, overwhelmed with information. I can tell you, as a marketer, that marketers are overwhelmed with information as well. We have the privilege to work here in the Bay Area. So let me share with you what a typical day would look like. The door knocks, here comes the Google Salesforce. We're big, we're mighty, we're smart. In fact, we're smarter than anybody else. We have algorithms for anything and everything in the world. 
We own 73% of the search engine. And by the way, the way, the way, the moment that the world moves to the cloud, search will be the only form of advertising. Plus, we're making ingrowns in mobile. Plus, we own YouTube. And the numbers of YouTube are also phenomenal. We all know about the 24 hours per second of content. The one that I like the most is 2 billion views per day, which is more than the combined ratings of the three major networks in the United States. Plus 15 minutes a day watching videos of which Lady Gaga is the most famous one or the most viewed one with 185 million views. Numbers, numbers, numbers. So here they go. And next come my Facebook friends. You know, Antonio, search is the past. Social search is the future. We have over six, 600 million people around the world. 70% of those are outside of the United States, which is important for you because you're a global marketer. The level of engagement, the level of peer-to-peer -peer communication. You should come and invest with us. And then here comes Zynga. The level of engagement of Zynga consumers is higher than the level of engagement in any of the other two functions. And they have hundreds of millions of people as well. And that's a unique opportunity for us. And then we're also in the e-commerce space. So Amazon comes in and any possible e-commerce site in the world. So I have the digital people and the regular people, all of them together, all looking at numbers. By the way, by the way, each one of the matrix that I just talk, talked about is different. Oh, and I'm a global marketer. So in many of the areas of the world, including some segments in the United States, TV is not dead. In fact, the level of inflation that we're expecting outside of the United States is double digit. And the rating for live events in the United States is up. Oh, and let me make it a bit more complicated for those of you that like econometric modeling. Then there's multitasking. Live events, like sports, where we have a vested interest, some of our numbers reflect that about a third of the people are using three screens. So they're watching the game, they're checking their fantasy football, and they're tweeting or communicating through Facebook on the phone. So how do you deal with all of this? You can't go just by judgment or feel. We needed to create a process. And that's what I'm going to here to, to share with you. The process has three parts. First, think audience first. Second, ensure that the principles of communications that have been born out of the social uh, network are pervasive in the communication strategy. And then ensure that you always are paying attention to three levels, paid media, owned media, as well as shared media. Audience first means that as a marketer, it's not only enough for you to understand consumer behavior, but that you need to understand the level of media in interaction along that path to behavior. Let me tell you what I mean. And this we stole from McKinsey. It's called the Consumer Decision Journey. 25,000 consumers from around the world, three continents and five categories. McKinsey knows data. They found out that you know, consumers have changed the way that they made decisions from the traditional funnels of awareness, consideration to purchase, where there was one or on most the advanced marketers two-way communication, to this double loop approach, where brands come in and out and the consideration Part of the journey involved an area called exploring that involves a lot of social engagement and communication. Importantly, that the purchase was not the end of the process, but the beginning of a second parallel process, which meant advocacy. So if you were satisfied with your purchase, you would become a fan. If you weren't, you would become an aggressive enemy. What does that mean? If you're buying a TV, you're going to go to Amazon to check for consumer reviews. From there, you're going to go to the side of the TV that you're interested in to get the features. 
From there, you're going to go to social media and ask your friends whether they have had any experience with that. With all that information, you're going to make a purchase. That purchase can be online, but most likely it's going to be offline in the real world. After you make the purchase, you're going to go back to the site to actually know how to use the freaking TV. Or you're going to ask your friends, which are going to give you the Cliff Note version of it. And if you like the experience, you're going to create the loyalty loop. And if you don't, you don't. That's the basis of the path to transaction or consumer decision journey. What's important about this and the big, big, big change in our, in our, in our approach was you have to do this first. The media strategy, the media analysis has to precede the creative development. That changed the way in which we were dealing with the agencies. Media strategy first, media plan first, creative second. Let me give you a very specific example. Cross-border. Cross-border, Mexico to the United States. By understanding the consumer decision journey, we were able to figure out several things. First stop, TripAdvisor. Again, recommendations. Where to stay, how to stay, places to go. From there, Facebook, friends. Do you know this place? Have you stayed there? Conversations. From there, let's, that let's, let's close the deal. And I'm going to go to that site where I'm going to get the best value. And I'm going to do two things. I'm going to pre-book my hotel, and I am going to pre-book my flights. Then I'm going to land. And I'm going to go straight to an ATM, because I'm going to need pesos just to ride cabs and to go to places where they're not going to accept my card. And then I'm going to go to those places that were recommended by my friends. Importantly, when the trip was over, I'm going to publish my pictures. And I'm going to become one more vote in TripAdvisor to begin the circle of yet another consumer. We had to figure that out, sweat those details first, in order to brief the agency. And the result is the program that I'm about to share with you. Video, please. I mean, as you can see, we went from the mega production shotgun approach to a very, very, very targeted approach following the consumer decision journey. Second step was in terms of content, how do we activate our digital engagement along the path to transaction, along that consumer decision journey? Three principles for development. This one, again, shamelessly stolen from our media agency partner, OMD. Sharing is the new giving. Participating is the new engagement. And recommendation is the new form of advertising. On this last one, actually the most interesting and compelling um, statement that I read lately in Fast Companies was some guy that said that in the future, marketing spending will be like sex. Only the losers will pay for it. 
which I found incredibly interesting. And the principles apply. Sharing. The first thing that we are, are doing as, after we follow the path to transaction in something like our investments for sports, which we do because it has proven to be one of the most effective ROI-driven activities that we do. For TV, we've used that during game time to generate awareness for the actions that are going to be happening on digital, particular digital spaces where people can close transactions. And then, by working together with our agency, AKQA, from San Francisco, and our friends in Twitter, we created a very specific event during Super Bowl to ensure that there was a level of conversation and sharing of the dialogue during that particular event, which serves as the closing activity of a three-month process or project call our NFL engagement. Let me show you a video on that. The second principle is participation is the new form of engagement. As I mentioned before, not only in the US, but outside of the United States, we have a very big commitment with global events, like the Olympics or the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup. Last year was in South Africa. Again, following the principles, we decided, and this was a global event, that TV was going to be the vehicle by which we were going to build massive awareness in international markets. One premise, show your three colors with the easier way to pay. From there, they were guided into action, malls and, and, and stores, where our display was prominently featured at the moment of transaction but that through an initiative developed by AKQA again, that we needed to create a level of conversation and participation during an, a, a period that only happens once every four years so that consumer can express their passion and also importantly engage in transactions. We did that for the World Cup. In Russia, we did a custom-made approach. The issue that we had there was education, education among 25 to 35 years of age in terms of the utilization of debit cards for international traveling. So let me show you in a moment what that looked like. But before that, the last principle that we had is called recommendation is the new form of advertising. And you're going to see here an, ex an example from Brazil. Brazil, we're launching the concept of debit cards. We have to educate consumers as to the benefits of using debit card at the point of sale versus using cash or going to the ATM and bringing cash out. Each media vehicle has been assigned a role. TV is the number one educational device because of the level of engagement that TV still has in Brazil. Having said that, the link is into a site where people sign up, participate to win for consumption, your traditional frequency of purchase type of engagement, done now 100% digitally, and you are actually able to recommend your experience to friends. 
This one is one that hit all the principles that I mentioned at the very beginning. Transactions up, total brand, not only the ones in digital. Brand equity up, gap versus key competitor up. And importantly, those people that were engaged with digitally directly increase not only their number of transactions, but the average ticket price of that transaction. So let me show you a video, video that summarizes those three initiatives. The last principle that we have is we're overlaying the consumer decision journey, or audience first, to ensure that when we're doing our media engagement platform, we cover three bases. And we expect our brand managers and agency partner to present it in such a way. What are we going to do in paid, and what is the role that played will have? What is the role of own, and how much we invest in that? And that includes interactions with our site. And importantly, what are our objectives on shared media and how do we intend to measure that? With that knowledge, with that knowledge, and utilizing some of the technology that we have available at Visa, we're beginning to create products that are able to intercept or interact the consumer across its decision making journey to ensure that we reward the level of behaviors that they have along those paths. But for that, we'll have to wait until next year. In terms of approach, these three steps, audience first, the three social media principles as, as, as guiding forces for content development, and the activation of paid, owned, and shared have become anchored tenants of the visa marketing way. Not because it's cool, not because it is up to date with what's happening out there, but more importantly, because it works as a business initiative. As I said at the very beginning, I've never been in more exciting times as the times that we're living today. In terms of what it's going to do for the craft, what it's going to do for the world, what it's going to do for San Francisco. So my invitation to you is let's seize the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. That was wonderful. We have time for some questions. So can we pull the house lights up? We've got microphones here, here, and here. Or actually, no, here, here, and here. And we'd love to get some people asking questions. Uh, it's a rare opportunity. Let me start. You, you, you spoke eloquently about social media and about your engagements with social media, so much of the time people who are on Facebook are, are trying to chat with each other, with their friends, as you were talking about with your daughter. Hope you like the guy, by the way, uh, the boyfriend. I've only seen pictures of him in yeah. Facebook, by the way. So you have display advertising within this environment, but there are going to be moments where people are going to be talking smack about your brand. Someone's going to have, in those very, very rare moments when someone has a bad experience and they attribute it to Visa. How do you, as an organization, figure out when you guys should talk back? What are, the, what are your principles, and how do you, uh, how do you uh, compensate for what's sometimes called uh, executive freakout mode, which is when one person who's an outlier says one bad thing, and we have to make sure that people don't think that suddenly the world is changing. So how do you approach 
talking with your customers, not advertising around their conversation? Well, the, the, the first decision that we, we had to make is that it's part of reality. You have to be there, and you have to be able to withstand the fact that people are going to make different comments about you at different points in time. So what we've, we've, we've had to do working together with our corporate communications team is to ensure that, they ha that we have mechanisms that are monitoring the conversation and that we have the right approach to understand when do we have to get in and when we don't. But for the, mo for the most part, I, we fundamentally believe that it is a price of engagement, if you will, and that you, you have to be able to withstand that if you want to be part of the conversations between people, which is what we're having today. All right. We have a question. Now, house rules, you have to tell us who you are. So, sir, please tell us who you are and, and go ahead. Christian Grant from Executive Talks. Uh, this year seems to be the year of uh, tablets, uh, the Playbook tablet, uh, the Honeycomb Android tablets, the iPad tablets, et cetera. Uh, what is your approach to um, marketing on, on tablets? Uh, uh, do you use um, AdMob or do you have your own apps? Um, how do you view tablets and smartphones? Well, um, as a platform for uh, again, again, it, it starts. It starts with uh, it starts with the consumer. Um, the the utilization of um, of the tablet. We've we've uh, and again, uh, I have to thank AKQA again for that. Um, within the context of the affluent consumer, is one of the most perfect vehicles for engagement uh, because it is incredibly target and because of the technology itself, it allows you to recreate a very premium and rich experience um, and a highly engaging one. And th that's sort of how we, we've used it. We've used it mostly for, for the affluent uh, consumer and it always started with, 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 with that understanding, who, who he or she was and what was the level of engagement that we needed to have in order to affect that path uh, to transaction. Please tell us who you are. Frank LaRusso, I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Mars Drinks, Division of Mars Incorporated, makers of M&M, Snickers, Dove. We, make, we bring coffee makers into offices and tea makers. And I noticed in your presentation, everything using the card. Where do you see the future of vending going with using our mobile devices to, to transacting the payment? Well, uh, that happens to be the most rec recognizable uh, a symbol that we have. Having said that, um, you know we have um, uh, about 17 to 20 percent of our transactions happening um, in the online world, both through um, uh, mobile phones and not. So um, um, that's that just happens to be a presentation. Uh, we we are we are all working. When you're when you sit where 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 I am, you have a group of people that are working very, 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 very hard to ensure that cards will never disappear. And then you have another group of people that are working very, 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 very hard to ensure that they do. <laughs> and, and, both, and by the way, both, both report into me. So, <laughs> so um, um, and, and it's the way that you have, you have to work when you are a leader in a category like this. There is no question in my mind that as we, we looked into the future, card not, not present will be the prevailing form, and we will be accessing, accessing our, uh, our funds uh, through different means, all of them technologically led. We have a question over here. Please tell us who you are. Uh, Michael Smith from Academy. Um, Antonio, you talked about media planning preceding creative, which is really interesting. And then Old Spice is an example, which I thought as well is very interesting. How do you ensure that you have kind of flexibility and reactiveness built into your media planning? to do things like that where you can actually be responsive to social media and the people in the, on the internet? Um, again, the, 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 it's, it starts first and foremost by, by understanding the journey on, on, the, on, the, on our different products. So Affluent Cross Border has one, Debit has another one, so on and so forth. And then after, after you're able to, to create that um, engagement plan, if you will, the creative development happens. Fine, the creative development is inspired on the brand lighthouse that doesn't change. So the idea is, 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 is already set. But the moment that you begin to develop according to that particular path, you're going to identify things that are going to be fixed and things that are going to have to be flexible. Um, 
and the way that uh, the, the way that our agencies are doing that is um, is is precisely that identifying these are the things that we should maintain fixed because these are the key components of your messaging, but that we are creating this particular modules where you're going to allow for interaction, reaction, and co-creation when needed. So we have time for one more question. Please tell us who you are. Yes, my name is Greg Tarr. I'm with Rogers Ventures. We're part of the large telecommunications and media firm in Canada. And my question is related to innovation internally as you're based in San Francisco. And how do you ensure that your teams constantly leverage and utilize a lot of the startup talents here in the Bay Area, for example, and don't get inhibited by a typical large company, NIH, if you will. Maybe if you can touch on what you do venture capital-wise and organizationally to make sure that happens. Well, um, um, although I wear three hats, head of strategy, head of M&A, and, and marketing, I am talking about marketing uh, today. Um, if, if you're talking about our, our, um, our level of engagement within within the, the startup community the first thing that we've uh, we're doing is sort of creating a vision as a company of where do we want to be in terms of the future of payments and what are the technological gaps that we have in order to get there and following that vision is that um, we were able to say you know e-commerce retail engagement is a gap therefore cyber source gaming, monetization platform, therefore play span, and there will be others. Enough said. <laughs> I don't think that's enough said, but that's all we have time for. Let's give Antonio a great Thank round you of applause. Thank you so very much. So, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ad Tech. The, sh the show floor is opening. We will be back in conference sessions at 10.30. We'll be back here for Guy Kawasaki at 1.15. Thank you for coming, and welcome to AdTech San Francisco.